I get guys who say, I really wanted to play football. I really wanted to play guitar. I really wanted to be an artist, but my mother needed me to do this. So pretty soon you see these embedded losses across, or I really wanted to fall. I really was in love with Susie, but I was, I felt anxious and guilty. I didn't know why. And I, I married somebody who, you know, I like, and she seemed right to me, but she fit my family's perception of what I should have as a wife but I didn't choose her. And now I'm, now we're both paying the price. Welcome to Husband Material. Today on the show, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Ken Adams, who is a certified sex addiction therapist supervisor and the author of this book, which has really changed my life, Silently Seduced, When Parents Make Children Their Partners. I just have to say, first of all, thank you for writing this book. It was one of the most difficult books I've ever read because I felt like I was reading my own life on, on the pages and what I saw was not very pretty. Well, you can join a lot of other men who have told me that. Some have thrown the book across the room. Some have thrown up. <laughs> so I have lots of stories. I did follow it up when Winnie's married to mom. Uh, I don't know if you saw that one, but it's a it's a version of silently seduced expanded in how it looks so for what that's worth well we've got all the links to these resources in the show notes so you can go check those out but really the topic here that we want to talk about is what you have called one of the underlying causes of sex addiction mm -hmm. which is enmeshment and particularly for this context of christian men with our mothers our relationship with mom and uh and and you've also talked about it as emotional incest. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by these terms? Yeah, so let, let's let's kind of give this a frame since you you have a sex and porn addiction as a central feature of your podcast. So there's lots of routes into sex and porn addiction, right? Neglect, abuse, abandonment, and enmeshment, which we're going to get to, and just simply exposure. So you can come from a background that's fairly normal, good enough, right? Nobody gets a perfect upbringing just doesn't work that way. Um, but there are families that are good enough who have enough love, enough functionality um, and so forth. And even those folks, you expose them enough to high arousal, uh, extreme sort of material, you can get hooked. So uh, there's lots of routes into sex and porn addiction. And um, over the years, um, you know, all of my colleagues have focused on abuse, abandonment and neglect you know, is causative, where the addiction becomes the soothing agent, the discharge of anger, the reenactment this time, I'll be the one deciding who's going to touch me and so on and so forth, right? But nobody was really talking about what happens to these men who are married to their mothers, who also have these profiles of sex and porn addiction. So I've spent a lot of years talking about that, writing about it in my first professional article, back in the late 80s, so I'm kind of aging myself, was, was actually on the connection between family alcoholism and this covert incest, emotional incest. So it is a causative factor, but not the only one. So let's just make that clear for your audience. So when we talk about enmeshment or emotional incest, what you're talking about is a relationship between a parent and a child and or a parent and an adult child that's too dependent too close and has the elements of being, you know, I'm mommy's golden boy, I'm mommy's surrogate husband, I'm mommy's, you know, sexualized boyfriend. Now there's been no overt sexual touch, so I've not been sexually abused in the classic way, but it's too close. And my girlfriend's not happy, my wife's not happy, my mother wants all of me, she tries to control my life, she talks to me about my her loneliness with my father. And, you know, part of me loves this elevated position, right? And because I got golden boy status and I was better than my father, which is, by the way, a, a central loss in these men's life. If the mother elevates the boy in competition with the father and says, okay, buddy, you're going to neglect me. I'll, I'll take hold of our son. He's mine and he's better than you. That's an ugly, painful dilemma for that boy. Because two things happen there. One, he wins the mother over. 
He's not supposed to win her over. He's not supposed to be the prince. He's supposed to lose out to the father. So Freud, who talked about that, and many people have kind of thrown Freud out in their thinking, but the truth is he had it right. And early, early on, um, a boy, assuming the boy is wired to be heterosexual, his first love is his mother. There's just no way around it. And, uh, you know, my son wanted to marry my mother. <laughs> my son wanted to marry his mother, my wife. And, uh, you know, it's so precocious little boys and little girls will want to have babies and marry their parents, right? Now, they're not reading Freud. They're not learning this on the Disney Channel. This is hardwired, man. It's hardwired to begin the romantic love journey with your parents. It's where it starts. I have the best mommy in the world. Now, the, the thing is, is that mommy is supposed to hold her boundaries. She's not supposed to extract from you more than she, she rightfully supposed to have. Her job is to say, that's sweet, honey, but you're going to go off and marry somebody else one day. And I'm married to your father, and he and I have a relationship. So that's the boundary that should be in place. And so then that boy falls in love with his mommy. He realizes he can't marry her. He goes off and has a crush on the girl at school. And the journey begins for him. And he's free now. He's free to be himself. He's free to unfold his sexuality, his romantic interests. And he's not bound to his mother because she's not made claims on him. She's let him go. So when we talk about emotional incest or enmeshment, it's the opposite. She's not let him go. She's used him in the service of her own loneliness. She's made him closer and dependent by guilting him, by um, talking too much about her personal needs or problems. And almost always she targets, and I say targets almost as if she's predatory. Most mothers do this without intent to harm. Although we have some who are quite aggressive and narcissistic. Now you've got bigger trouble when they're narcissistic. But most of them have these sort of dependent, codependent, bad marriages. You know, they kind of fall into it. And they too lose their identity to their sons. They become too focused on their sons. The son is too focused on the mother. But she always chooses the empathic, sensitive boy. Not the boy in the family who says, I'm doing my own thing. Work that out yourself, right? So she chooses the temperamentally empathic boy. And so naturally he absorbs, he absorbs the feelings and the problems and the neediness and the romantic interests of the mother. And he begins to feel married to her, enmeshed with her, too close, too involved. And so that becomes very problematic for him because now he's tethered. So he wants to be free. He wants to fall in love with somebody else, but he feels bad that he leaves his mother behind. So he begins a series of compromises. I'll put one foot in this relationship while I have one foot in still taking care of my mother. Or if I can't be free, I'll go act out in porn because that, that image is making no demands on me. I can be completely free with a porn image or with a um, escort or a sex worker or maybe an affair um, because they're not making any emotional demands on me. So now all of a sudden, sex and porn addiction look very attractive. Because I need to feel free erotically because I got this woman complaining to me, my girlfriend, my wife, and I've got this woman, my mother, also holding me. What about me? Where do I fit into this? So sex and porn addiction become, it becomes very alluring because it offers a false sense of freedom. I can be free in my porn addiction. Of course, if you're addicted, meaning you can't control it, even though you try, that's the short definition of addiction. It's a prison. It's a it's a trap. It's it's you're not really free. So that's that's a broad, maybe more than you wanted, but that really is what we're talking about. Is the son is too close to the mother. The mother expects from him that which he shouldn't, and he takes on those needs and expectations as if as if they're his to meet. 
And then he tries to have a relationship, a marriage, and he's not present. And he says, okay, sweetie, wife, girlfriend, here, you can have part of me, but you can't have all of me. Now, if, she's, if she has her own wits about her, she says, oh, no, that's not going to work here. I don't, I don't share you. I want the full love affair with you. So I get lots of, so I was, we were talking about this before we started. I get lots of emails from women who say, you won't believe what I put up with for the last 30 years, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I, I, what do I do? Is that They always end with, what do I do? And I say, well, I, don't, I don't know what to say to them, <laughs> except send them to the workshops. I run a series of workshops for these guys. Read, it, read the books. How do I talk to him about this? So what you notice is that if you try to talk to these guys about this, they get very defensive. They feel very protective of their mothers. And I am one of those guys. I was in that place not too long ago. And reading about these dynamics and thinking, oh, that makes sense for other people. But when it comes to me with my mother, it's natural to think it was normal. That's just the way it is with all boys, right? It was loving. She loved me so much. It is so difficult psychologically and, and so painful just to identify I grew up with a mother who treated me as if I was in the role of her husband. I mean, it's it's absolute madness. There was a sentence that you wrote that 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 hit me like a freight train. You said, there is nothing loving or caring about a close parent-child relationship when it services the needs and feelings of the parent rather than the child. Mm -hmm. It's very true, I think. Now, we have, we have a number of kids coming out of families that lack em empathy. That's its own problem, right? We have a culture of narcissism these days. And so that's problematic. But, but the kids we're talking about who will later become very empathic, sensitive adults lose track of themselves because that, that relationship has been inverse. You're here to meet my needs. And you're right. There's nothing loving about that. The parents, I, I've been saying this lately, and I, I've gotten this. I've had probably mm, five, 600 men over the last half a dozen years that have come from all over the world, different cultures, and very, very strong religious backgrounds, all the way from Christianity to Muslim faith to Jewish faith, where there's sort of a built-in expectation of honoring the parents, with, which I think we probably want to chat about a little bit. What I've learned as I've listened to these men is that not only has the mother been sort of this, created a surrogate partnership, you know, but she's also become the false guy. The man worships the mother. And she holds a place in his world that really is improper. And I've been saying lately, and I know this as a, as a parent of a 19-year-old boy, who has his own life now, his girlfriend and so forth, and is hanging out with dad and playing baseball. It's not his first priority anymore, right? And the more I bring it up, the less he wants to do it. So I had to learn to zip my lip when it comes to, can we play catch today, you know? But what I've learned is the last spiritual assignment of the parent is to let go and take the loss. It is not up to the child to cushion the blow. Now, having said that, of course, I hope my son has some reciprocity, some feeling towards the family that he wants to return. But here's the irony. If you, if you look at the literature on family therapy, which is where I learned a lot of this stuff, families, we call them family system therapists, who look at the whole system and sort of treat the whole system. What, what, these, uh, what these clinicians observe is that separation invites closeness. The paradox is if I let go, my adult son or daughter wants to return to me as a peer. Now, they don't want to be the golden boy or golden girl anymore, and they don't want to be my little boy, but they want to come back and they want to visit because I'm, they're free to visit. They're not obligated to visit. And that is the transitional space, is that men who have been in your position and um, have an, a sense of obligatory assignments of loyalty, which is very problematic if you're trying to have your own life, your own romance. 
if you feel bound by obligatory loyalty to the parent, I have to take care of you, mommy, because you're so lonely because dad's an alcoholic or, what, or he's left or whatever the case is, or he's rigid or angry. Um, and, or ironically, sometimes the boy takes on the view of the father that is the mother's view, and he discovers that he wasn't such a bad guy. I can't not tell you how many men have discovered that they have taken on their, their mother's view of their fathers at a cost to their own relationship because she's needed them to hate him too. And I have a lot of guys who correct that and say, you know, he wasn't such a bad guy. Yeah, he was a little self-centered sometimes, but he had to put up with her sometimes. So it's interesting to watch that the transition has to move from obligation. I'm not here to please you. You were here to give me a life that allows me to move into my own journey. That is the assignment of the pen. You know, the great um, uh, poet, Lebanese poet, Gibran, I'm going to get this right, but he had a series of poems on different topics. And one of them was on children. And he started the poem out, I'm not going to get it quite right, but he said, your children are, are life's longing for, their, for itself. They come through you, but they are not of you. They do not belong to you. Some version of that, I got that wrong, and hopefully Ron will forgive me, uh, long since passed. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, this obligatory guilt is really the, what needs to be shed. And a lot of guys that you talked about, you know, in these sort of protective, if not defensive positions, feel like they have to amputate their mother. And so they, they get very protective. So first of all, they're in a role of protector that they shouldn't be in, right? So they, they've, that, that assignment's been reversed on them. So that protective mechanism that you, you talked about is, is, is partly because the role assignment of you having to protect mother should not have been there in the first place. She should have been protecting you, right? Giving you the freedom to say, no, mommy, I'm, you know, it's not my job. I, I know you're struggling, but I'm going to have my own life here. And the journey is to emancipate, not amputate. And so if you can let guys know that they can return to that relationship on their own terms, then it gives them a sense of ability to, to hear you. They don't have to defend it. So reminding them that, so I have to tell guys all the time that we're here to help you emancipate in the workshop. We're not here to help you amputate your, your parent. Now that, although it might mean that I have a period of separation. If I'm in a marriage and the marriage is not working because mom, you've been too interfering, I might need four seasons when you're just kind of, you know, Maybe I, maybe I have all the holidays of my wife, I reestablish my marriage, and then I come visit you and dad. So there are sometimes boundaries that have to be part of that process. Um, but amputation is not what, amputation is not emancipation. Emancipation is I'm my own man. I'll come visit and love you on my terms. So I won't stop loving and caring for you, but I'll be defining how that goes. That's very difficult for guys that we're talking about here. And it almost sounds like too good to be true. Really? I can have that? Is that, is that even something I deserve? You said there's a lot of guilt and shame um, around this. And also one of those big emotions is anger. Mm -hmm. So how does this kind of arrangement between mother and son lead to anger? Yeah, you know, I mean, you're right. The truth is, is there is a lot of anger and pent up, you know, feeling um, burdened. And so, you know, I comply, I'm the good boy, because you taught me how to be a good boy, right? So I'm assigned the role of good boy, but underneath I'm seething. I'm tired of coming over and changing light bulb. You can do it yourself. 
I don't want to be, I'm trying to have a life and you're calling me three or four times a day. I don't need, you don't need to call me three or four times a day, right? I don't need the emotional weather from you every day, right? Your job is to take care of your own emotional weather. That's not my job. So all of those moments build resentment. And because, even though I don't, if, so if you ask these guys, are you angry? Oh, no, I'm not angry. <laughs> but if you really, if you, if you listen and, and you, you ask a little, a little more, so tell me more about, so I've learned not to be so direct. So tell me more what's it like when your mom calls you in the middle of the day. Give me a sense of that. Will you? If I'm a fly on the wall, tell me how that feels. But I don't mind. And then I get quiet. I let him fill the space up in the session. You know? And pretty soon, oh yeah, it's getting to be a pain. You know, eventually the, the, the truth comes out. I don't like this, but I don't know what to do about it. So you have this collection of grievances. And those, that anger turns to loss. Now I'm in my third marriage. And you're still telling me, mother, you don't approve of these women in my life. So I have loss and resentment combined. And we call that grievances. Grievances will drive addiction. I'm owed. I deserve. I'm entitled. So you're right. Anger is a big issue. So it really is incumbent upon the man to say, you know what? I have to re reorder this relationship because I don't want to be living in my anger. anymore. And furthermore, I may displace it onto my wife or girlfriend or partner. Right. And, um, and, and if, and if they have, depending on how their faith, so if you don't mind, maybe we can turn to that, but how the faith is delivered or how it's interpreted, honoring the parents, you know, um, you know, sort of biblical, um, invitation, if not assignment, um, to do so, they feel a bit in a bind. How can I be, how can I honor my faith and emancipate? And there's another one too. Because the Bible talks a lot about forgiveness. Yes. So I feel like I can't be angry. I need to forgive her. Yeah. So here's the trouble with that. Forgiveness and that is a mechanism of denial and dismissing rather than true forgiveness. Whereas forgiveness in, in the context that I'm thinking about it is more the endpoint of a reconciliation of my feelings in the relationship. And by all means, we want to reconcile in a state of forgiveness. But if it starts off that way, it's merely, it's merely a cover for denial and dismissal in many instances. And it's, a, it's, it's the attempt to bypass the difficult work. Yeah. yeah let, me, let, me just, let me just kind of, the trouble is, is I can forgive you a hundred times in the course of a week and I still am angry because I'm still trapped by your obligatory assignment. So that doesn't go away regardless of the capacity to offer forgiveness. And pretty soon you're getting worn out because you're still bringing that anger home to your wife. You're still masturbating to porn. Where's the reconciliation? Not working. So in order to reach that place of honoring my parent and forgiving my parent, I actually need to grieve. You do. Absolutely. The loss is tremendous. Yes, I, I, you got it right. You, you hit the nail on the head. There's a loss. From, so it's interesting. We see the parent not wanting to let go of the boy. But oftentimes the young man or the man says, I like this golden boy status. I don't want to give it up so fast. So you're right. There is a loss. There is a grief. And absolutely. I will tell you more about that. It is so nice to be able to call mom and ask for whatever I need. And it's there on the next day in an Amazon package. But that comes at a cost. And it comes at the cost of remaining in the role of a child. And as long as there's a part of me which is still back there, then I'm not going to mature into the sexual and emotional adult who can be free from porn. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you, you said it well. That's a, that's a brilliant statement. Thank you. I, I learned some of it from you where you talk about developmental trauma, because that's what this is, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not one. It's not one specific acute PTSD issue. It's a long-term disruption of the normal developmental process in which you collect losses along the way. So I get guys who say, I really wanted to play football. I really wanted to play guitar. I really wanted to be an artist, but my mother needed me to do this. So pretty soon you see these embedded losses across 
or I really wanted to fall. I really was in love with Susie, but I was, I felt anxious and guilty. I didn't know why. And I, I married somebody who, you know, I like, and she seemed right to me, but she fit my family's perception of what I should have as a wife, but I didn't choose her. And now I'm, now we're both paying the price. And you're right. It's a, it's a developmental trauma uh, issue. I, I, right on target. And it, which is why it's so critical to get busy emancipating. And by the way, uh, emancipation is not a negotiation. You don't need your parents' agreement. You'd like their blessing. You deserve their blessing, but you don't need it. It's not, I, I have therapists, colleagues who are very smart <clears throat> and I like them a lot. And then I'll send them, I, I run these workshops that are designed to sort of shift the cathartically uh, these men out of this guilty place. And so I, I've, I've had to refer these guys afterwards to different therapists. And I have some of these therapists bring in the parent the next day, uh, the next week. And I about fall off my chair. And I think that's the last thing you should be doing. This is not a negotiation. He needs some space. And interestingly, in those cases that I know of, where the therapist brings in the parent in a family session, which feels to the boy, the young man, like a marital session, by the way. Mm, wow. He relapses in his sex or porn addiction. So emancipation is not a negotiation. It's, it's, it's your assignment. Your life assignment is to be your own, is to follow your own spirit, to unfold that soul and that personhood in you. And your parents' job is to, is to celebrate, and sometimes painfully, it's hard to watch, my, you, know, my, you know, I have, uh, I mentioned my son is off in college now and so forth, and it's different, it's different. I don't, you know, we used to play baseball every day and I meet him at school, we go to the ball field, it's just not happening anymore. And I miss those times, but it's my job to take the loss. And I watched that with his mother and my wife, when he didn't want to be hugged at school anymore, when we dropped him up at school, she cried and I had to hug her. And You know, the parent's job is to take the losses along the developmental route. So the child doesn't have to take, have to fix it for the parent. So my goal in emancipation is not amputating or cutting off my relationship with my parent, but becoming a peer, becoming a peer to my parent, a fellow adult. In time. It might mean boundaries temporarily. So sometimes geographic or, or boundaries allow some space. Boundaries by themselves doesn't emancipate your identity. You may still spend every day feeling guilty. It, it's an internal job to say, not my assignment. To grieve, you said it well, to grieve the losses and to let go of my own hold on this relationship. This is so good. I'm breathing a sigh of relief because That's good. I hope I hope your listeners are too. Yeah, yeah, and I almost cried back there when you were talking about some of the losses uh, in a marriage or in uh, passions that we had that that never fully bloomed. I was I was in tears, man. I have guys who have careers who who never wanted them because their sense of themselves are so convoluted by the parents' needs that their identities have merged. Her needs, her feelings become my feelings and needs. I don't know what mine are. So you ask me what movie I want to see or what, where I want to go for dinner, I don't know. What do you want to do, right? What we used to call codependency, which is going out in gold right now for some reason, but uh, I'll let others talk about that. Um, but there's what we used to call codependency, which is I don't know who I am without you. Right. And some of this that you can get, there's many routes to that issue, but enmeshment will always lead to that because my identity was never separate enough to know that. No, no, I don't. Yeah. You don't like daddy, but I like daddy. And I get to like daddy different than you. I don't have to absorb your view of my father in order to be loved by you. And if we grow up in this way and I grew up in this way, we become very skilled at sensing the needs of others. 
Absolutely. And at meeting those needs, and that feels comfortable for us. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to my own needs, I'm not even supposed to have needs. Very true. You know, we were talking earlier, you know, I come by this topic, honestly, my, my, um, long before I started writing, I grew up in a, in a mesh system. My mother family came from Hungary. And so you see in first generation cultures, my mother was born here, but all of her family was born in Hungary. And uh, so you see a closeness and I, I love the warmth in that family system, but boy, there, <laughs> there was a guilty obligatory assignment. You know, you have to go visit your grandparents. <laughs> I don't want to visit my grandparents. I want to go play baseball, you know, um, or you have to go get your aunt a, a birthday card. Get my aunt a birthday card, you know? So I, I, I remember I was in a, in a card shop once getting my aunt a birthday card, and I had no idea that, that I was under a guilty obligatory assignment until the woman at the catch is for, wow, you're getting your aunt a birthday card? Boy, you're such a nice guy. And I thought to myself, I, I don't want to be such a nice guy. And that's the very thing, right, is that, you get tuned into needs that are really not to be bothered with. They're not yours to do. My aunt probably could care less that I sent her a birthday card. Except, and, and so, and I have to even watch it today. As many years as I've been on top of this, my wife says, oh, the light bulb needs to be changed or the dog has to go out. And I can feel the part of me that wants to drop whatever I'm doing. Oh yeah, I'll do it only to be angry later that I dropped what I was doing. So I've learned I have to be very careful one day at a time. This is like an addiction. You have to practice one day at a time. I don't have time right now, hon. I can get to it later. That's hard for me to do. That's hard for me to do. Your need is not my need. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean I may not want to please you out of a love relationship, a love contract. You know, people do that in love contracts, right? Um, but I don't have to jump every time you have a need. And so part of the recovery, so you kind of, the recovery process is boundaries, emancipation on my own man. I got to have my own space, mom, dad, family. So you also have to keep the proxies away from you. So mother always has agents and proxies, brothers, sisters, father, calling you up and saying, have you called your mother lately? We have to be careful about the proxies of the Amesh parent, and they become as much trouble as the Amesh parent. So the, the process of recovery is boundaries. Give me some, I need some space here. Reconstructing who I am, grieving the losses. What is my, my role is to take care of you. My role is to take care of myself, commit fully to this marriage I'm in, to my career, to my parenting, to be present here. And then to practice one day at a time, is that my need or your need? And what is my choice here? And that, that's where the fine print is. That's hard to do on a daily basis. And if you do too much compromising, the resentments go back up. And enmeshed men are notorious for what we call, in my level two workshop, we call them troublesome compromises. Co- troublesome compromises, where guys say, oh, no big deal. No big deal. And I remember once I was visiting a couple of friends out in, I tell this story all the time, out in California when I, where I was teaching. And I hadn't seen these guys in a long time. And I, um, I, I decided I wanted to buy, oops, sorry, I decided I wanted to buy dinner to, to these friends. And one of the friends I got, I got into the car and they were right into their story about not having money or having difficulty with money. And I could feel the part of me right there who now felt I had to buy them dinner. And I thought to myself, now, if I act out of that, someone's going to be to pay the price. It's going to be my wife when I get home. She's going to ask me to do something, and I'm going to get angry. Uh. So I, I fought the whole dinner. And I, when the check came, I handed over my part, and I kept my, and I didn't buy dinner. And I always tell the guys, I tell the story, tell them, before you think I'm cheap now, I took my buddy out the next night, my other buddy, and he took me to the most expensive restaurant he could find in the Bay Area. And I didn't think twice about buying him dinner because I didn't feel obligated. So you have to learn to not act out of that obligation. Because once you begin to compromise, somebody pays the price, you and probably your romantic partner. And it feeds the grievance story, by the way. Yes, and, and possibly paying the cost 
with feeling extremely triggered to sexually act out. Absolutely. I love the way that you said it earlier. When you were at the cash register buying a card for your aunt, you said there's a part of you that said, maybe I don't want to be this nice guy. Mm-hmm. And that's the part that says, well, I can be a different guy. And porn allows me to be that guy. And at the end of it, there's a clean break. No more obligation. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I don't feel neutered. Because that's the issue developmentally, is that my sense of passion and purpose has been neutered at worst or interfered with at best. Which, which is, by the way, the subtitle of my workshop is, is moving from guilt and ambivalence to passion and purpose. And I have to tell you, it's, it's the spot on, you know, uh, stake in the ground for, for the men we're talking about. Moving from guilt and ambivalence to passion and purpose. I love that. And it is the journey. It is the journey. And, it's, it's, and you're not going to find it in the porn. It's, it's a false promise that somehow I can have my passion. And yes, it's true that I lose my erection here because I'm so burdened. So by the time I get to my, my wife, I feel obligated, burdened, tired, exhausted, caretaker. Now my body doesn't want to function because I have to please her. But the porn says no obligation here. Now I can be erect, literally, symbolically. So it's very seductive but it's a false representation. There is no freedom in addiction. Yeah, there's no freedom in addiction. Um, mm. and, and there's no arousal in obligation. No, that's right. That's really well put. I like the way you said that. No, there is no arousal when you feel obligated. No, that's why porn is so seductive because you can bypass that temporarily. Yeah, and it can come out in other ways like a one night stand or getting into a relationship and breaking it off early. Exactly, exactly. A, a repeated sort of um, serial monogamy, yeah. right? I can show up for about three to six months and I'm done. But once, once you want more commitment from me, I can't handle that. I'm moving on. So you run these workshops. We've talked about them a little bit. What is the Mother and Mesh Men workshop and how can it help? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I was, I've been treating men, you know, I've written this, I've written, wrote Silently Seduced, published in 91. So I've been working with this for a while. Yeah. And I noticed that it was difficult to get this transition, this sort of shift. No, no, I'm not responsive. So I'd make a little headway in an individual session, but then by the time I saw them a week later, they'd have five contacts with mother and I, we'd be back at it again. So I created a workshop about, gosh, it was in the end of 2013. And where the men come in for four days, now it's by Zoom, uh, although I do have one in person in September, but because of the pandemic, we've moved to Zoom primarily. So I have a hybrid now, you can have choices. Um, And what we do is we kind of cocoon these men into the workshop and we move them from this guilty obligatory stance to, oh, my mother is not my God, and she's not getting into my space where me and God exist. Nobody gets in there. Nobody. Not my mother, not my wife, not my dog, me and God. My second circle of intimacy is for my spouse or my partner or my girlfriend, my kids, not for my mother. My third circle of intimacy, contact, of closeness is for people who have my best interest in mind. Now we get into some difficult choosing. We'd like our family to be there, but not always is our family our best cheerleaders. So the the workshop cathartically shifts these men out of this internal sense of I'm I'm obligated forever to take care of you to no, 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 no. I get to choose how I love you. So we have guys who come into the workshop whose mothers have been uh, passed away for years because it's an internal shifting workshop. Now, some of the guys work on boundaries. So we, we uh, you know, I, I, do, I do eight or 10 a year of those. I have a level two that's kind of a toolboxy kind of level. So I'm, I'm in try- we have a new workshop for couples because the partners and the spouses have been putting up with interference in the mother for years and they've just about had it. So we, we get these 
a lot of these guys get into the workshop because the the, the romantic partner says it, it's time. You either choose me or your mother. I mean, literally, literally. So we have this. That's the kind of sample we get to see in our workshop. So we now I have a colleague actually from California who's going to start doing a facilitating a couples workshop in which the which the spouse is going to have a chance to have uh, her feelings heard about what it's been like to put up with mom. And then for the two of them to co-create a couple's contract about how they will visit, how they will deal with that, so that the wife has a say, knowing full well that the husband still has to figure it out himself. So the end of the workshop. So we have these pieces in, you know, I've been, I have a, work, um, a website called overcomingameshment.com. So I've been trying to work on building these pieces. It's my last piece of my legacy professionally is to create a series of experiences, uh, workshops, workbooks that can be kind of passed on in which both the man and the couple can be free to have their romance be the primary romance, God in his rightful place, and the mother and father still love, but they drop down the list. So I have a series of workshops that are kind of building on that and and so I, I love the workshops. It's just it's great to watch these guys, to watch these guys shift that energy. I had a couple uh, consulting sessions with the couple men from different workshops with their wives, and they didn't know each other. And both of these women, unsolicited from me during the consulting session, said that was the best sex I ever had with him after the workshop. And I laughed. I can never promise these guys that, so I'm making no promises. <clears throat> Um, but it told me that what these guys were doing, reclaiming their selves, their bodies, their spirits, their sexuality, this is mine. Nobody gets, nobody gets to have a hold of this. Not my mother, not my porn, it's mine. So they could show up. I wasn't surprised at all that I heard those stories. It was just amazing. It, it just helped reinforce to me that, oh, we're right on target here. Right. So anyways, yeah, and there's lots of ways to skin a cat, as you say, but these workshops are designed exclusively for that. You can't get into them unless you have this issue. So I get guys who call me whose mothers have abandoned them, but they don't get into the workshop. So it's only for men who have these obligatory, guilty, contractual links. Yes. So it's very homogeneous. So you get guys, you, you listen to a half a dozen seven, eight men tell you a story, it's amazing to listen to that. And even if you're not ready to do a workshop, we've got some books and the overcomingenmeshment.com website listed in the description. So wherever you're at, you can take the next step from guilt and ambivalence towards passion and purpose. There you go. Well, Drew, it's great, uh, great talking with you. Thanks for having me. Great interviewer. I appreciate you bringing your personal story to it. It's really nice to see that. So good luck to you and uh, keep in touch. Let me know how things are. Thanks. I will. And as we finish up, what is your favorite thing about this freedom and emancipation? Well, I think I have to say that, that the lens of life changes when you're not under obligatory guilt. It, it's a fresher view. All things are possible. I'd have to say that the view and the experience of life feels much more welcoming. It's beautiful. I'm just taking a deep breath, feeling inspired. Good. Thanks again for being with us and for everyone else. Always remember, you are God's beloved son and you, he is well pleased. Mm -hmm.